time-worn treasures. And what we're looking at here is a ship made either out of beef bone or mutton bone. From the land of locks and glens, it's Antiques Roadshow UK. See it Sunday evening at 7. Focus Asia, cracking down on Islamic militancy, but does China risk creating a backlash in its Muslim minorities? Supporting conviction or country, the dilemma facing India's Muslim population in the war on terror. And finding acceptance, how Muslims have adapted to life in Hong Kong. Hello and welcome to Focus Asia from our studios in Hong Kong. I'm Mark New. Muslims all over the world are currently marking Ramadan, the traditional month of fasting and prayer. So this week we're taking a look at some of the issues facing Asia's different Muslim communities. We begin in northwest China in the province of Xinjiang, where ethnic Muslims have lived for more than a millennia, and where for the last half century, They've been fighting for an independent Islamic state. Jennifer Lee reports. The Pamir Mountains, the forbidding marker separating China from Central Asia. 50 kilometers beyond is Afghanistan, the prime target in America's war on terror. On this side of the mountain, a similar battle. Here in northwestern Xinjiang, China is fighting its own war against Islamic militancy. This is the home of China's Uyghurs, one of several Muslim ethnic groups in the country. The Uyghurs have lived in this rugged desert region for more than 1,250 years. But in the last 50, its hardline activists have been fighting for an independent Islamic state, sporadically carrying out bombings and assassinations. Chinese officials believe thousands of Uyghur separatists are getting support and training from Afghanistan's ruling Taliban, even claiming they have links to Osama bin Laden and al-Qaeda. With Muslims in Afghanistan waging jihad or holy war against America now, China fears their religious zeal will spill across the border. Some extremists within the Muslim community will use this as an excuse to increase their separatist activities and to challenge China's current government and order. Citing such a scenario, Beijing is demanding international support for its long campaign to wipe out Uyghur separatists in Xinjiang. Since the September 11th terrorist attacks on America, it has sentenced to death at least five separatists. Like other Asian countries facing Islamic militancy, China is using the war on terrorism to justify its treatment of Muslim extremists. Well, definitely the, the Chinese government see that as an opportunity to legitimate the massive violations of human rights that are happening in Xinjiang for over uh, 10 years now. At the same time, the Chinese authorities, both in Beijing and in Xinjiang, launch uh, a very harsh crackdown on everything deemed uh, separatist in Xinjiang, including mass rallies, uh, sentencing rallies, uh, arrest, uh, uh, public trials, and even a uh, death uh, uh, sentence. But experts warn a backlash against Muslims in China will only serve to unite them all. A Muslim is a brother to another Muslim. So in Islam, we have this uh, universal brotherhood. Uh, brotherhood, but in a sense that if a Muslim is being uh, harmed or being hurt, uh, then the other Muslim group will try to come and help or to relieve. This is a general principle. The American-led attacks on Afghanistan have already provoked widespread protest among Muslim groups in Asia who regard the bombing campaign against bin Laden and the Taliban as an attack on Islam. 
With the Chinese government publicly backing America's war on terror, China's Muslims are now finding their loyalties divided. Nowhere is that clearer than in Yujie, Beijing's largest Muslim neighborhood. Most Muslims, including many Uyghurs, came here to make money. But they're also keen to voice their politics. America is always like this. They take economic sanctions on any country they wish, yet they talk about so-called human rights. On this matter, they're not practicing human rights. We are on the side of the truth. I think they deserve a lesson. Afghanistan bombed two buildings in America, and America bombs five buildings in return. How many days has America been bombing Afghanistan? How many bin Ladens have they killed? Innocent Muslims are suffering. This will cause endless problems. I'm sympathetic towards the refugees of Afghanistan, but I also feel sorry for the victims in America. Tension has been building in New Jia since September 11th. We were forced to conduct those interviews covertly, out of sight of police recently deployed there to maintain order. The Chinese government also turned down our request for an interview, and China's Muslim leaders were banned from speaking to us. With 18 million Muslims among its population, China is understandably nervous. The Muslim, they are not feeling happy about the um, U.S. attack on Afghanistan. It's a form of aggression. The strongest superpower attacked the poorest country in the world. So it is a form of injustice. Uh, at the same time, the Muslim in China, I think they feel that uh, it is inappropriate for the Chinese government to support the U.S. It is appropriate for the Chinese government to support U.S. to erase terrorism, but not attack Afghanistan. If China continued to support the U.S.-led attacks on Afghanistan, how would that affect the country's Muslims? I think the grievance will increase. The mood of Beijing's Muslims isn't helped by the government's destruction of their neighborhood. Homes that once housed generations of Muslim families are now being raised to make room for more profitable structures. It's a purely economic decision, but some Muslims see it as a symbolic gesture. In my family, four generations have been living here. They tried to frighten us, but we were not frightened. I've seen everything. I'm almost 80 years old. My wife is so scared she's sick. We have no money. We're just waiting for them to get rid of us. Given the uncertain mood of the country's Muslims now, China is moving cautiously. It must balance its support for the war on terror and its desire to contain separatism in Xinjiang without provoking a backlash within its Muslim communities. Coming up, exploring Hong Kong's Islamic heritage. But next, the dilemma facing Muslims in Hindu-dominated India. To outsiders, perhaps, it's natural to think of India only as a Hindu nation. But it is, in fact, one of the world's largest Islamic countries, home to around 120 million Muslims. The U.S.-led war on terrorism in nearby Afghanistan, however, has placed India's Muslims in a difficult position, testing the very foundations of their faith and their patriotism. Rob McBride reports from Old Delhi. In other countries, in other protests by Muslims against the war, the stars and stripes would be burnt. Here they're turned into costume for a street performance by a radical theatre group in a poor Delhi suburb. Their own take on world events. Prime Minister Vajpayee competing with his Pakistani opposite number to become America's plaything. There is a competition between them. If, if America is asking them to sit down, they want to lie down. Both of you are, 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 singing, are singing songs for America and trying to befool us. 
uh, that uh, we are at war with Islam. With one of the largest Muslim communities of any country, the reaction of Indian Muslims to the war has a profound impact on the whole Islamic world. And it is a reaction which is bound to be tested by the competing loyalties of country versus religion. Within sight of Old Delhi's main mosque, the restaurant run by the Qurashi family observes a daily ritual. A food handout to the local needy, in accordance with zakat, the Muslim practice of giving away two and a half percent of your wealth to those less fortunate. For Fazalur Rayman and his family, India has been good to them, and when it comes to his government's support for the American-led coalition, he preaches what he practices. Don't bite the hand that feeds. Ultimately, I have to support the country where I live. We live in India, and it is our duty to abide by the laws of the land. Those who aren't happy doing that, then there's nothing stopping them from leaving. They can go off and find causes to fight for. Included in that number might be his own father, Rematullah, offering, despite his age and bad hearing, to fight alongside the besieged Taliban. The family, like so many of the Muslim community in India, clearly split over its reaction to unfolding events a couple of borders away. But it's a reaction which is largely muted. Coca-Cola, Whirlpool washing machine. Limiting itself to relatively tame acts of defiance, like a ban on certain American brand goods in accordance with an all India fatwa. And everyone goes along with this? Everyone oh, most, of the, most of the people go along with this. Are you uh, abiding by this as well? I, of course, this is my old my dean fatwa. In a country that is divided along so many ethnic and religious lines, the Muslim reaction to the war has been conspicuously quiet, more by design than by choice. Just the mere mention of a cause that brings people out onto the streets is enough to set alarm bells ringing in a country which has a long and painful history of communal violence. As long as the war continues in Afghanistan, so will the fear that its repercussions may yet be felt here in India. Already isolated incidents of violence between minority Muslim and Hindu groups has raised the specter of more widespread violence should Muslims become more active in their opposition to war. But what has angered many moderate Muslim commentators is the alleged use of that as an excuse by the government to ban Muslim anti-war protests while demonstrations by other groups are allowed to go ahead. Surely the government is not taking very kindly to any, uh, any Muslim protest. But what is extremely interesting is that there's been a lot of protest in India against the American bombing, but th that protest has not, is not Muslim protest. In, in other words, if Muslims were to protest American bombing, even if it is from a pacifist standpoint, uh, that is opposed as against many others who seem to be uh, opposing it for, for the right reasons. The government of Prime Minister Vajpayee, led by the Hindu nationalist BJP, clearly denies any accusation of using war as an excuse to clamp down on India's sizable Muslim minority. This is a country which prides itself on being democratic and secular. But what matters is that's how many moderate Muslims, the Hassans among them, perceive their treatment right now. I think what, what these kinds of incidents uh, do is to, uh, as it were, bring the community together uh, and obviously uh, one platform that is readily available and which cannot be denied to the Muslims is the mosque. So you would find many more Muslims in such situations uh, attending public congregation prayers. Uh, you might you, you notice a greater fostering of Muslim solidarity. Uh, you know, so, so these kinds of things happen. I mean, they need not necessarily, as I said, express themselves in, in more strident ways. If India's Muslims are becoming more devout in response to war, then evidence of that can only be anecdotal.
The imam at this mosque told us he hadn't perceived an increase in congregations, but he also told us his own nephew had been arrested in one recent street protest. Even if you do protests, what's going to happen? Nothing is going to happen. It's not going to change things. So what's the point in protesting and risking arrest, especially if you're the breadwinner and you have a family who depends on you? The size and form of demonstrations do not necessarily reflect the mood of a whole community, and the Muslims of India may be undergoing a more subtle transition as a result of the September attacks and their aftermath. A reaction that may see them at the center of global changes. Uh, ironical as it may sound, uh, the idea of a pan-Islamic community uh, in modern language, a transnational community, I think is, is sort of finding tangible expression uh, after September 11. I mean, one has been hearing about pan-Islamism for a very long time, but that was more of a romantic and idealized ideal. Uh, I, have a, I have a feeling, I may be absolutely wrong, but I have a feeling that September, post September 11 incidents uh, have provided sort of some semblance of coherence and unity to an otherwise highly divided Muslim world. I think it has fostered a worldwide Muslim solidarity. Coming up on Focus Asia, how Hong Kong's Muslims have adapted to Chinese culture. To Hong Kong now, one of Asia's great multicultural cities. The Islamic community here is a sizable one, with roots in many different countries from India and Pakistan to Africa and the Middle East. Despite their diverse origins, Hong Kong's Muslims have largely found acceptance within the local community, adapting to their Chinese surroundings, but also holding on to their own identity. Susan Yu has the story. Hello. The morning call to prayer for Muslim youngsters. But this isn't Pakistan, Indonesia, or Malaysia, where these scenes would be common. This is Hong Kong, home to 70,000 Muslims. When for the first time I came to Hong Kong, I don't know anything about the Muslim community. Our school has a Muslim students, and their families are mainly Muslim. They want to the children, they pray. And for that Muslim people, they need to see that their children are praying. This primary school in Hong Kong's new territories close to the Chinese border is unique. It was established in 1996 after Muslim parents here had been struggling for years to find for their children schools that were sensitive to their Islamic heritage. When they grow up, they will be the maybe strong Muslim and their belief will be strong and faithful. Muslims make up half the 240 strong student body. The United Muslim Association runs the non-government funded school. It recruited staff from Turkey, Pakistan, India, Nepal, Ghana, the Philippines and Africa. The curriculum is like any other except for one item, a course in Arabic prayer. Because our uh, praying language is Arabic, not the Indian language or the other languages, Pakistan language. The praying is Arabic language. He explained them how to do, say the pronunciation properly. As these young Muslims are taught the ABCs of their faith, they've also learned how to adapt to the local Chinese culture. Most speak Cantonese. That's essential for acceptance in Hong Kong society. Personally, myself, I don't feel any discrimination because I can speak the Cantonese language like, uh, you know, uh, uh, Chinese, all right? But there are discrimination against, uh, you know, 
Muslim from Pakistan, Muslim from India, or Muslim from Indonesia, and so forth. Muhammad Ali Din's family has been in Hong Kong for generations. He heads the United Muslim Association and manages Hong Kong's only Muslim center for the elderly. This is room number three. Assalamu alaikum. Mm. No, these are all Muslims. Uh, these are Muslims. And then uh, she's the oldest inmate here. These women are from China's Guangdong province. Like the Islamic school, this home for senior citizens is open to all nationalities and religions, but is run on Islamic principles. Halal food is served, meals done in an Islamic manner. Relatives of non-Muslim patients are banned from bringing in pork. And just around the corner? Now, we have here a prayer hall. Every day we have students coming in to learn Quranic. Islam has a place in Hong Kong history, longer than most people realize. In the year, in about 1875, there was a fighting between Chinese government and the British. The Britain want to conquer and take the Kowloon. That time they brought Indian army. They came and fought. And for them, this land was given and a mosque was built here. That was in 1896. Since then, the mosque has served Muslims from all walks of life. Ali Ting fled China after the communist takeover in 1949. The Nanjing native is one of many Chinese Muslims practicing their faith here. According about the Islamic come to China, they have it from two ways. One from land, one from the sea. The land is from the Xinjiang area, uh, come to the south. And the one way is from the seaside, come to the Guangzhou. Uh, it's about 1,400 years ago. The total Muslim community here are around 70,000. Uh, nearly half Chinese and half international Muslim, which they come from uh, Far East and uh, Africa and the Little Middle East. Friday prayers at one of Hong Kong's five mosques. Islamic worshippers have come here since 1890. The Jamia Mosque is the first and oldest mosque in Hong Kong. It's listed as a historical heritage site. That's testimony of how deep the Muslim community's roots lie here. And there are now plans for an Islamic cultural center to be built on the premises to further raise awareness and understanding of the Islamic faith. But some say awareness and understanding are in short supply, despite the Islamic community's history dating back to Hong Kong's establishment as a British colony. The ethnic Muslim minority has been campaigning for 10 years to get government approval for a sixth mosque to be built in the outskirts of Hong Kong. In our project, we have a school, a secondary school. We have an old age home of 150 beds, and we also have a small clinic and so forth, you know what I mean, where we can, you know, uh, give some welfare facilities to the local people. It helps this parking lot can be transformed into the new mosque. But the project has come under increasing public opposition. Residents say they fear the mosque would drive property prices down, increase racial tensions, and most importantly, apprehension, especially after the terrorist attacks in America. It's these kinds of misperceptions Muslims say they want to dispel. Because every Muslim, they follow Islam law and also respect the local government, no. We cannot say you are Muslim, you will be against anyone, no. You have to be followed and respect the local law. We have always been law abiding, all right? Uh, you know, see, we also pay our tax. And then if you were to go uh, to the, uh, what you call it, Stanley Military Cemetery or the Taiwan Military Cemetery, you can see there are a lot of Muslim soldiers buried there. 
they have sacrificed for Hong Kong. They have also, you know, uh, uh, supported and uh, Hong Kong, uh, you know, in such a way that Hong Kong became a very uh, rich and pro prosperous uh, country. The heritage of Hong Kong's Muslim community. And that's all we have time for on Focus Asia this week. Next week, we travel to Pakistan and India to see both sides of the conflict in disputed Kashmir. And time for a cup of tea? We learn more about the lives of Sri Lanka's tea pickers. Please email us if you have any comments about the program. And don't forget you can look at our archive of stories on our website at focusasia.startv.com. Until next week, I'm Mark New. Goodbye. Thank you.